today I want to speak to us on the fight against fear. The fight. How many of you have had to battle fear in your life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so let's take our text from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. And if you are looking for um, sermon notes, remember they're on our website um, where it says sermon notes. One of the tabs there is for sermon notes. And if you um, actually have the website on your phone, you get it as a, it also on our Facebook site, a link is provided there, okay? Now, it says here, come on, let's read together. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, you may notice it's not the ESV, it's the New King James, because um, this is the verse I memorized from the King James. Let's say it again, please. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Father, I pray today that you will bless the ministry of your word. Father, the Holy Spirit will come and empower the, your word, O oh God, and minister to our lives and, and remove fear, dispel fear, anxiety from our lives, O oh God, in the name of Jesus and instill faith. Let faith arise in our hearts today. Spirit of God, do a special work in our midst today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but as we enter into the colder temperature, right? I mean, it, it dropped like 20 degrees within 40 hours um, a week or two ago. And, um, you know, we have to brace ourselves for winter. Not everyone loves winter. Sandra was telling me this morning she loves winter. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say that. Winter can be a tough time. And especially for some people who've got like seasonal affective disorders, um, winter can be pretty horrible on them, right? You have not just the winter blues, but sort of depression. And um, what's even more fearful now is that in addition to, you know, hunkering down for winter, we've got the second wave. The second wave, which has come a bit earlier than expected, right? COVID. And even the prime minister, you can tell from, from what he said um, a few days ago, this is actually um, kind of, you know, affecting him. And he says he bears sort of the burden of the nation. And, you know, remember his words when he says, as our numbers pass 10,000 in terms of deaths in, in Canada, he says, this sucks. <laughs> this really does. It's going to be a tough winter. It's easy for us to throw up our hands, to want to throw up our hands. It's frustrating to have to go through this situation, isn't it? It's like, how long has it been, beloved, since we're all, we can all sit close to each other? You know, and he didn't have to separate these chairs and create such distances. Um, he could pack 100 people or 110 people in here. It's been like such a long time. Yeah. Um, the resilience of individuals, families, and, and nations is being tested at this time. Teachers are stressed because of the online teaching they've got to do or they're unable to do. And, of course, adding to all those woes we hear of the delivery um, services that charge 30% commission on, on the foods that you, you would buy from the restaurants, and you probably just want to drive up there and buy it yourself. Isn't that so? That's preposterous. Um, so all of this pressure brings on worry. It brings on anxiety. It brings on even fear. Now, this may be just semantics for us, but I'm just going to dive into these words a little bit. When we say we are concerned about something, it means that you're consciously caring about a situation. It's not in your subconscious, right? You're, 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 it's, it's in your level of consciousness now. When we worry, you're beginning to uh, afflict yourself with mental distress. When you're anxious, it's, it's increased worry. It's a sense of uneasiness in your, in your mind, in your body. You're losing your peace of mind. And it's not just mental, but it's also physical. And as I said a few weeks ago, if it's an anxiety disorder, it means that, well, it is beginning to affect your function, right? Whether at home or at school or with your friends and so on. And then we know severe anxiety leads to fear. In fact, there are some phobias which are listed as um, in, in that group with anxiety disorders. Agoraphobia and, and things like that. Um, so they want us to talk about this fear. 
And my, my take home point is this. It's one simple, simple statement that God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not from God. Amen. What is from God? Okay. What is this from God? To combat fear. Faith. Faith. And um, so the definition for, let's understand fear a bit. Um, the dictionary says fear is an unpleasant, often strong emotion that is caused by anticipation or the awareness of danger. It is an unpleasant emotion. And we see danger ahead, right? And, um, you know, a flight and, 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 and things like that begins to, to take place in your body, that, 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 that desire. Fear implies anxiety and usually a loss of courage. Isn't that so? A loss of courage. Because there is the fear of the unknown. There are other words that are associated with fear, and those are the words dread and terror. Dread and terror. Some people are naturally quite fearful. You give them any kind of proposition, and they're thinking about the worst possible outcome. Isn't that so? You know people like that? The worst possible outcome. That, that's what comes to their mind. Well, let me tell you my own experience with, with, with fear. You know, in 1980, that's about 40 years ago. And I, I was um, pretty young then. <laughs> so I come from a country called Guyana. And um, we moved from the coast into the interior region. And, um, it, it, you know, on the coast, it's pretty much flat flat land, you know, it's th that's the topography um, in that area. And as we move inland and into the interior, it's more like hilly sand and clay, so lots of hills. So the, the house we were living, a small house, and it was on this, the slope of a hill. And as we got there, you know, my dad was an agriculturist, so he got a tractor to come in, break the fence down. The, the tractor came in and plowed the, the soil. And this was not a garden, this was like a little farm, you know, in our backyard. And so I was there one, one afternoon trying to clear out the rocks because there were a lot of rocks there and trying to prepare, you know, the beds for, for, for sowing, for planting. And I remember this guy, it was hot. Remember that day? I think it was a Saturday. And I remember, you know, it was pretty hot that day and everyone else went off to the falls and exploring and so on. And there I was working. And the guy next, you know, he was passing down, walking down the hill and he said, um, hey, look, there's a snake behind you. <laughs> so... I didn't really bother with him because I'm thinking snake, well, you know, as big as this, a garden snake, right? He's garden snake's fine. And after, you know, he insisted, he said, look, there's a snake behind you. And um, I turned to look. And about 20 feet away from me, I saw this huge snake. I've never seen a snake free, you know, out of a zoo that big before. And this thing was about 20 feet away from me. And it was like almost, I think it was probably eight feet in length and, you know, it was huge, it was green in color. And I literally, that's the only time in my life I can remember freezing. I was frozen. I just couldn't move. That was fear. That was fear. Now, I'm scared of snakes. I'll tell you that. I know that was the cause or before that, but I'm afraid of snakes. But, I mean, the amazing thing about this is that I was also amazed at the same time at the speed in which the snake was gliding over the beds and so on, moving very fast, so smooth, you know, as smooth as a snake. <laughs> Anyways, I was so fearful. And um, you may have had your own experiences with fear. I mean, I know one time a guy came and he helped me up. I was going home from church one night and he, he, he stuck me and my friend Dave. Uh, he had a knife to us, you know. And um, Anyways, stole my watch. Now, there are other examples of fear that we can remember, like remember the Twin Towers when they fell? How did you feel that day? What about the tsunami in 2004, right? I guess when you go to a beach now, somewhere in the Caribbean, Hawaii, wherever it is, you're on an island and, and you're there by the, uh, the beach and you're enjoying the ocean and so on, you're kind of thinking back, what if this ocean begins to come unto me? There's a tsunami here. Now, where does fear originate from? Very interesting. Very interesting. We can trace the origins of fear all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. The Bible tells us that when 
Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they sinned against God. What happened? First of all, they noticed that they were naked and they took fig leaves to cover themselves. But then the Bible tells us when God came down, the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. You see, when we sin, when we disobey God, when we drift away from him, when we remove ourselves from the presence of God, his covering over our spirits, his spiritual protection, fear begins to enter into our lives. You know, we sense that loss, we sense that void deep in our hearts, and that leads to fear. So the closer we get to God, the less fearful we should become. But the further we drift from him, the more we're opening up ourselves to fear because we're losing that protection over our lives. Fear comes when we lose God's comforting presence. All the while in Eden, they had everything they needed. They had peace. They had joy. They had security. They had companionship. They had communion with God. But now with sin and shame, the future is uncertain. Already, you know, Adam realized, you know what, Eve, we really messed this up. We really made a big mess of this. Have you ever been in that kind of a situation? Where you realize you did something and boy, did we really blow this. Or did I really blow this? Did I really make a huge blunder here? You know, things are not going to be the same again. Adam realized we can never go back to before eating that fruit. And the Bible doesn't say it was an apple, by the way. Now, how many times in our lives we found ourselves in that same position? Where you did something wrong and you wished you can go back, but you know that you can't. There are times when you wish you can turn back the hands of time. It's not so the clock. I mean, some of you did turn it back last night, didn't you? Well, you don't have to these days, right? Everything's so automatic now. Um, that affair, that lie, that theft, whatever it was, you know, that incident, something you did and you realize, wow, that really changed things for me. So it's always important that we make the right choices in life and we avoid sin and so we live with less regrets. Isn't that so? One of the things that in the world, the world tells us that, well, everyone else is responsible for what you do. The Bible tells us that we are responsible for what we do. You say, we, I, I'm kind of maybe blowing it up a bit. But no, but there's a tendency in the world, let's not blame that person, let's blame their parents. Let's blame their environment. Let's blame this, let's blame that and the other. Bible tells us that we are responsible. All right? And if we make the right choices in life, there will be less regrets for us. Isn't that so? So here we see Adam experiencing fear. And the Bible tells us that the last days will be marked by fear. So if you, as I mean, as some of you who are older, or maybe I should say some of us who are older, you remember, uh, you know, in your, in your teenage years and so on, you, you, you didn't sense all of this fear and anxiety in the world. It was pretty cool back then. Maybe boring when you look back now, but you didn't have all this tension, all this stress, all this anxiety, all this worry. You can even see it is telling on the kids, on the teenagers. They're anxious. They're fearful. And today there is anxiety, fear around what? Global warming, mega fires, super storms, food safety, infectious diseases, lawlessness, anarchy, racial hatred, poverty. This is what the Bible says in Luke 21 and 25. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity. Perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. I remember when the tsunami came, that's the verse I kind of went to. And that's what Jesus said, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. It's not the way the world feels right now. People are fainting with fear 
and with foreboding what is coming on the world, what does November 3rd bring to the United States and to the rest of the world? Jesus forewarned us about this increasing anxiety and perplexity in the world. And as humanity drifts more and more away from God, we live our lives in increasing rebellion against God. We are reaping the consequences of that. And the only way to correct that is to get back to God. What are we afraid of? Well, we're afraid of the fear of the, there's the, the, fear of the future. The future. None of us knows what the future holds. Sometimes we can become depressed and the future looks pretty grim. Currently with world events, the tendency to be fearful is so real. Like people in Nigeria, you know, I was having a chat with Jimmy. She was telling me about SARS and so on in Nigeria. You know, and why the protest is on. I couldn't believe the atrocities there. And I know what, what is transpiring from the, the, that particular group of policemen there. Um, but people are worried about their sons, you know, and what, what will happen, you know, if that group of police officers come for them. The economy, people are worried about the economy, um, you know, with the rising prices of houses here in Toronto. Are you thinking about your ch kids? How are they going to afford a house? Are my children going to be okay? Are they going to be able to survive in the world in the future? In John 16 and 33, this is what Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Listen, I'm not one of those faith and prosperity preachers to tell you that come to Jesus and all your problems are going to be over. Because the Lord Jesus whom I serve said something otherwise. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. He says, but take heart. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. And when I read that, I can be courageous. I can be, I can take heart. I can be encouraged. Right? There is also not just the fear of the future, but it's the fear of death. There's so many who are afraid of dying. Fear of dying. You know, there's some people who avoid funerals. Isn't that so? And even the visitation, they wouldn't go. And God forbid there should be a casket there. They're not going to go and take a peek at that dead person. They don't go to cemeteries or anything like that. You know, and you know, at one time, even the disciples, they were afraid of dying. The Bible tells us one day, um, Jesus said, let's go across to the other side. He left the crowd. He took them in a boat. And um, there was a great storm that arose. The waves were breaking into the boat. And the boat was filling up. Uh, but what, where was Jesus? He was in the storm and he was asleep. He was there sleeping. And they woke him up and what they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are dying? We are perishing. And what did he say? He said, the Bible says, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he turned to them and he said, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid of dying? Have you still no faith? You see, Jesus can handle the greatest fears in our lives. That's why the psalmist said this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death's dark valley, I will fear no evil. That's what the psalmist said. I remember when I was, the church I was pastoring back uh, in Guyana there, this lady um, was sharing her testimony. She said, you know, I was so afraid of death. I was so afraid of dying. And then, you know, I, I was listening to this radio broadcast and I gave my heart to Christ. And that, you know, that disappeared. The fear of dying. I was afraid of dying without knowing God. But thank God, he had mercy on me. When we respond to the voice of God speaking to us, we believe the gospel and we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He is able to remove the fear of death from our lives. How many of you are, still af how many of you are not afraid of dying anymore? Raise your hands. 
I'm not kidding. I'm asking you a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, let us not talk about that. This is what the Bible says. He himself partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. He will destroy the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death. That's where we were, isn't that so? Deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Some will turn to false religion because of the fear of death. Isn't that so? Some will go and visit um, people in the occult because of death. Some people want to talk to those who are dead already. Don't do that. <laughs> then there's another fear. It's the fear of difficulty or impossible situations. How can I handle? Come on, come on. Isn't that what goes through your mind sometimes? Now you know, you know that God delivered you and God brought you through some tough times in life. Isn't that so? Amen. But still sometimes you sit and you think, I wonder if a tough time comes, will I be able to manage that one? Isn't that so? You sometimes wonder. But look, the same God who brought us through the storms in the past, he will take us through the storms in the future. Amen. He will. When Israel was at the Red Sea, now can you imagine anything more fearful than to know that you, your family, your relatives, your entire people, they're going to be slaughtered. They're going to be wiped out by the greatest army on the earth that day. Remember Israel, about 2.4 million people had left Egypt. They were not trained as soldiers. There was no army. You know, they were slaves. So they had a slavish mentality. All right? An inferiority complex. The Egyptians are more powerful than us. They're going to kill us. They're going to annihilate us. They're, we have no weapons. We barely made it out with some food so that we can go on this journey. They were totally unprepared. They were, un, they were disorganized. No military training whatsoever. And here's the greatest army on the earth that day is coming against them to take them out. The Bible says in Exodus 14 and 10, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. They feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And Moses said to the people, fear not. Fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. You know, there's a song that says, he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build a home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. That's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Your mom and your dad may forsake you. Your friends may forsake you. A spouse may forsake you, unfortunately, sadly. But Jesus will never, ever, ever leave us alone. Amen. He's a friend, the Bible says, who sticks closer than a brother. So what should our response to fear be? First of all, we need to recognize that fear is, no, is not from God. Realize that fear is not from God. For the Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now fear can be an emotion. Right? It can be a feeling. But there's also a spirit of fear. And sometimes, many times, these emotions, right? And these feelings open up a doorway for a spirit to come in. Are you hearing me now? So not because someone is fearful, it's always a spirit of fear. But if we give in and we open up more and more um, to fear, to begin to take control of our lives, we can open up ourselves to a spirit of fear. But God is able to deliver us from a spirit of fear. Amen. Someone may have lust in their hearts. 
And if they continue to pursue and think upon that and ponder and, and maybe read books and pornographic literature or, or movies and things, that, as they open up their minds and their hearts more and more to that, what they um, open up the door to is a spirit of pornography. Some may fall into adultery, but then they can um, open up a doorway to the spirit of adultery, fornication, sexual immorality. So, the Bible tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of power, love, and self-control. Fear is an attack on our confidence in God. Isn't that so? I said it again. Fear is an attack on our confidence in God. You know, I have a friend. He's a physician and a pastor back in Guyana. Dr. Shiv. And he told me this ridiculous story one time. I thought he was crazy. He said this. You know, Mike, one day this guy came into my office. And he wanted to hold me up. He had a gun. And he was sticking me up in my office. He was coming to steal. What happened? Do you know what he did? He fought the guy off with the gun. I'm thinking, what? But he said, he said, Mike, I'm afraid of nothing. I'm afraid of no one. He said, wow. And truly, he is that kind of a person. Amazing. I mean, I don't know. If someone comes to me, like, what am I going to do, right? I'm not telling you I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> but that just goes to show fear is an attack on our confidence in God. Whenever we give in to fear, our eyes are focused on the situation instead of God. Isn't that so? When we give in to fear, uh, we are looking more at the situation than we are looking at the God who is able to help us and take us through it. Amen. Secondly, we need to understand that God does not desire us to live in fear. This is what it says in the book of Proverbs. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. When you're living for God, you don't have to be afraid about disaster and so on. You know, look. Life is whatever it is. Let it come. Let me live. Let me just trust God today. Not worry about tomorrow, as Jesus said. Right? Tomorrow has enough troubles of his own. Uh, if ever problems come, God is going to take me through. He's going to help me. Amen. Isaiah the prophet was warned. He says, God told him, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And that's a word for us today in the world in which we live in. He says, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, nor climate change. I know, yes. But do I need to be afraid of climate change? Or do I need to have a reverential fear for God Almighty? Are you hearing me? He's in control of the climate. We are warned against fearing what the world fears. Aren't you worried about this? Aren't you worried about that? Beloved, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. He is God. He's in control. Amen. And he has the answer to whatever is going on. Amen. Psalm 91. He says, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. COVID is real. Now, we've got some conspiracy people who don't believe COVID exists. It's all a hoax, right? Now, I can't believe where people get this kind of nonsense from, right? People are dying every day, but they're, they're saying it's a hoax. Don't wear masks. We've got the anti-maskers and so on. Listen, when you know the Lord God, your life is in his hands. And COVID can't get you unless God says it can get you. Now, I'm not saying that nobody's going to, um, you know, they, will get, they won't be Christian. I understand, unfortunately, Pastor um, Swindoll, a you know, wonderful man of God. I, I know how true it is. His wife died of COVID. I don't know how true that is, but probably shouldn't say that unless I know for sure. But, um, <laughs> you know, but there are many people who are, you know, they're falling to COVID. They're dying. But, beloved, what did Paul say? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Our lives are in the hands of God. Don't be afraid of COVID. I mean, you take all the precautions. Take all the precautions. 
right? Wear the mask. W wash your hands and so on and so forth. Thirdly, we need to take a stand against fear. Here's what the psalmist said. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Come on. You know, one time God had to tell Ezekiel the prophet. I was reading that this morning. He says, and you know, sometimes we live in a world where people are becoming so hostile to Christianity. So hostile to, to, to what the Bible teaches. You know, and even the looks on their faces. And as you say, if looks can kill. But you know what God told the prophet? You know, that's nothing new, beloved. That's nothing new. God told the prophet Ezekiel, do not be afraid of their looks. And they look at you. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. And don't be afraid. Come on. It's time that the people of God start being bold for Jesus. Because we have the answer. We have the truth. The truth. And there's only one truth. Amen. Two things that are opposing, that are contradictory, cannot be true at the same time. Jesus saves and only Jesus saves. Amen. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. And it is true. And it's going to last forever. Um. The Lord, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? The next thing we need to do is receive the peace of God. What did Jesus say? Peace I leave with you. This was his legacy. This was his legacy. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Neither let it be afraid. Number five, we need to realize that our help is in the Lord. Amen. It's not in the government. Thank God for what the government has been doing through all the, you know, the bailouts and so on and helping people, um, whatever you call it. Um, but our help ultimately is in God. The Bible says this, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is our help. I love this psalm, Psalm 121. The psalmist said this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your help keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And finally, we need to fight fear with faith. Jesus said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? When Jesus here, what he's doing is that he's opening up our understanding on fear and faith. How diametrically opposed they are. When faith goes, fear comes. And maybe that is the reason why there's so much fear in the world today. Because people have lost faith in God. There is no God. So who's going to hold them firm? Who's going to keep them secure? Who's going to cover them? Who's going to protect them? Who's going to watch over them? When faith goes, fear comes. So when faith enters in, fear has to leave. Fear has to leave. So I want us to make a declaration today, beloved. Let us all stand together. I want us to say these verses in the Bible. Let's make this declaration today. God is our refuge and strength. Let's start again. Come on. God is our refuge and strength. Let's say it again, but we said this time. God is my refuge. God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble in COVID. A very present help. 
Go on, let's go on. Therefore, and let's say I, not we. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. God has not given us a spirit of fear. 